All right, so we're going to start out um, the first couple weeks, just or first week doing Gen Chem review. How many of you took Gen Chem more than a year ago? A few people. So this will be good practice for those of you that haven't had Gen Chem in a while. Um, but let's start off talking about organic chemistry. Does anybody have an idea of how we might define organic chemistry to somebody that's not a scientist? Anybody want to share? What do you think? It's all about carbon. It's all about carbon. How many of you had Mark Allen for chemistry? Yeah, so he used to tease me all the time. He's like, it's just carbon and hydrogen. How hard can it be? Um, yeah, so organic chemistry, the definition is chemistry involving carbon. Depending on how nitpicky you want to be, we'll throw in the anhydrogen. So for example, some people, when they look at carbon dioxide, they say that's an inorganic molecule because there's no hydrogen in carbon dioxide. However, most organic chemists say anything involving carbon is typically organic chemistry. We're pretty lucky because when we're working with a periodic table, we're just using that tiny little corner. We're not going to be using all of the metals or um, transition metals for the most part. Um, we will get into them once in a while, but we're going to focus really heavily on carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. All right, so then the question is, well, why have a whole branch of chemistry that focuses on just one element? Does anybody know why? So why is carbon special? Yeah, we're carbon-based. So let's make some notes. Oops. Also, if you notice me misspelling, please correct me so I don't look like a fool on YouTube. <laughs> so we are carbon-based. What does that mean? In fact, it, the majority of our body isn't made of carbon. What's the most abundant molecule in our body? Water. We're big bags of water. Um, so we're mostly made up of oxygen and hydrogen, right? But we call ourselves carbon-based life forms. Why? Think about your biology classes. What are the most important biomolecules? What was that? Oh, come on. Some biomolecules. How do we do, uh, encode genetic information? DNA. DNA and RNA. So nucleic acids. That's how we encode genetic information. What's another really important biomolecule? Think about cell structures. Proteins. I heard somebody say lipids. What's the other one? Carbs, carbohydrates. If you look at the backbone of any of these, they're all carbon-based. It's essential that we have these carbon-based backbone biomolecules in our body. That's why most of you are here, as a lot of you are pre-health majors, right? So why do you need to know about organic chemistry? Well, your whole body is reliant on organic chemistry. All right, what's something else unique about carbon? It can make four bonds. I'll say up to four bonds. Why can't it do more than four bonds? Does anybody remember a rule? The octet rule, right? So carbon can make up to four bonds. It can do this in a wide variety of ways. So it can form rings. It can form big, long chains like polymers. Um, it's really, really versatile. Um, so anything from diamond to biomolecules to graphene, um, all of that is organic chemistry. So I find it really fascinating that one type of element is so versatile that it can do everything from make up um, biomolecules to make the essential components inside solar cells. All right, so now we get to go into a little bit of chemical history. Does anybody know the name of this chemist? Gilbert Lewis. Gilbert Lewis is, I call him the godfather of organic chemistry. He's got a really interesting story. He was a, a rather unpleasant human being from what I've read about him. Um, people didn't like him very much. He was nominated for the Nobel Prize 
41 times. Never got it. People just they don't like him very much. Um, does anybody know what he's known for? Lewis structures. He's also known for the covalent bond. He's known for valence bond theory. He's known for Lewis acid-base chemistry. How many of you remember that? Yep. Uh, he's known for chemical thermodynamics. He was the first person to isolate heavy water. Does anybody know what heavy water is? Not quite. That's hydronium. Close. Heavy water doesn't have hydrogen. It has what in it? Deuterium. So it's an isotope of hydrogen that's a little bit heavier. It was an essential um, component of building nuclear reactors. Um, so in the early 30s, it was a huge race to um, develop systems through which we can make heavy water. He was the first um, person to do that. He was the person who named photons, um, and he was the first person to explain phosphorescence. So if you look at what he did for chemistry, arguably no other person has done as much for organic chemistry as Gilbert Lewis, but like I said, he was a jerk. Um, made a lot of people angry. In fact, I was reading about it. Um, he had a big rival named uh, Irving Langmuir. Has anybody heard of him? So he won a Nobel Prize basically by stealing Lewis's ideas and getting them published first. So Lewis didn't like him very much, and I read the story about him where he had to introduce Langmuir at a talk, his rival. So he shows up to this talk, has to present his rival, who's presenting arguably his own work, right? He stole most of his work from Lewis. And so he comes in with a cigar and he said, and this is a quote, today our speaker is Irving Langmuir, about whom we have heard so much and from whom we have heard or have seen so little. So he went around like poking the bear um, and because of that, number one on Nobel Prize. Anyways, he's the first person to describe a covalent bond. So Langmuir really understood how important this was, and Langmuir got most of the credit for bringing it forward to um, the greater scientific community. What is a covalent bond? That's when we share electrons, right? So it's a sharing of electrons. And I'm going to abbreviate electrons from here on out as just E minus between two atoms. What happens when there's no sharing? What happens if electrons are just transferred from one atom to another? What type of bond is that? Yeah. Ionic. So he was the first to accurately describe a covalent bond versus ionic bond and distinguish them as unique and separate from one another. Um, very, very important. The other thing he did was he developed a system for drawing things called Lewis dot structures. Most of you have covered Lewis dot structures, maybe all the way back to high school, but I think it's a good idea just to briefly review some of these Lewis dot structures. All right. So Lewis dot structures, we always want to put the element symbol right in the middle, right? So let's say we've got hydrogen. We would just draw it H. We don't actually draw out the full name. And then what do we put around it? We need to include electrons. How many electrons? One. So hydrogen has one valence electron, so we just put a dot around it. All right, let's pick another one, boron. How many valence electrons does boron, boron have? Three. How do we determine how many valence electrons an element has? Periodic table. The easiest thing I do with a periodic table is I look at the group number. So group one contains hydrogen, group two contains beryllium. Because we're organic chemists, we ignore this whole section, not important. Then we go over here, <laughs> we've got three valence electrons, four, five, six, and seven. So just count your way over in the periodic table and just completely ignore the transition metals. Pretend like they don't exist. All right. We've got a few more. We said carbon is kind of cool because it can do four 
bonds, when we do these electrons around carbon, make sure you stagger each side before you start pairing anything up. And then what about fluorine? Seven. So we want to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So make sure you are comfortable with loose dot structures. If you need to, just go back in your Gen Chem textbook and review a little bit. There's a brief section in the OChem textbook, though. So the key thing is we only include valence electrons. And then the other important aspect to loose dot structures is we know that electrons really like to be paired. In fact, we talked about that with covalent bonding. We said that electrons can be shared between two separate atoms, right? So that was another observation that he made. So the observation is that electrons like to be shared. And so one example we had was through a covalent bond. Does anybody know another example where electrons like to be paired, but they're not necessarily in a bond? Lone pairs, exactly. So when we draw Lewis dot structures, we tend to focus on these two key points, that electrons want to be paired, um, either in covalent bonds or as lone pairs. Does that mean that electrons are always going to be paired? Yeah. No. Does anybody know what we call an electron that doesn't have a pair? A radical. So we will get into radical chemistry later this year, so there are some exceptions where electrons don't pair. But typically radicals are quite unstable and are looking to pair. So the observation was that electrons tend to be paired but aren't always paired. All right. So let's do some loose dot structures. All right, so key things to remember is we need to pair electrons. That's a key thing. And then the second one we mentioned before too, is that atoms prefer to have eight electrons around them. That's that octet rule, but did you notice how I use prefer? I didn't say atoms always have eight electrons around them. It's frustrating in chemistry, right? We teach you a rule and then we teach you the exceptions to the rules. So instead we're gonna just use the word prefer because there will be a lot of situations where this rule is completely broken. All right, um, another thing to remember too is when you're looking for the eight electrons around an atom, do you include one or two of the electrons in a covalent bond? You include both of them. So you want to include all of the electrons that are making up your covalent bonds in a molecule, right? So that's a key, key thing that students forget about. All right, next one is we want to include formal charges. on specific atoms. All right, and I'll talk more about what I mean by this, but what really bugs me is when students will draw a Lewis structure and then they'll just put a, a stray negative charge in the corner somewhere. I'm like, okay, that has a negative charge, but which atom does that negative charge belong to? So in organic chemistry, we need to be very, very careful to put the negative charge or positive charge on the atom where that charge resides. Um, we need to make it incredibly clear um, for whoever's looking. All right, so now the question is, how do we determine the charge on a specific atom? It's pretty straightforward. What you want to do is find the valence number, meaning the number of valence electrons. 
subtract your lone pair electrons. And then subtract half of your bonding electrons. So it's really not too bad. All right, so let's do an example really quick. All right, so let's take NH4. I'm not giving you any charges here, but let's see if we can figure out what the charge is by working our way through drawing this. So what do you think the central atom is for NH4? Nitrogen. nitrogen. Okay, so I'll go ahead and throw nitrogen in. How many valence electrons do we have around nitrogen? Five. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and draw those Lewis dots around nitrogen. All right, and we've got four hydrogens, right? Okay, so hydrogens have one valence electron, like we said, so I'll put four hydrogens kind of equally spaced around. That's how I like to approach Lewis structures. All right, so now what we need to do is we need to start pairing up electrons, right? Because we know that electrons prefer to have a partner. Okay, so some of these are pretty easy, right? So like down here, I'd say, well, we can pair these electrons. It's no problem. We can pair these electrons. We can pair these electrons. And we can pair those electrons, right? Okay, does anybody see a problem, though? So let's look at that nitrogen, right? We said that up above, atoms prefer to have eight electrons around them, and we want to include all bonding or shared electrons, right? So if we look at nitrogen, I'm saying two, four, six, eight electrons bonding, and then we've got an extra one left over. That's a problem, right? Because we know that atoms prefer to not have more than eight electrons around them. So a simple solution. I'm just going to take this electron and pluck that electron out, right? To satisfy that octet preference of having eight electrons around it. So now when I redraw this, I'm going to say, okay. We're going to replace those dots that are now bonds with lines. That nitrogen has four hydrogens around it. We plucked off that electron. So if we removed an electron from nitrogen, what charge would nitrogen have? Positive. So what we should do is include the positive charge right next to that nitrogen. My pet peeve is when people put it up in the corner like that. If it's up in the corner, I don't know where that charge belongs. Does it, does it belong to a hydrogen? Does it belong to the nitrogen? Put it on the nitrogen so we know what we're looking at. All right, so we're going to stop there. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, I'll stick around after class. I know a few of you wanted to borrow textbooks, too, so we can head up to my office, and I have a few uh, loaner textbooks available.